So uh, our first speaker is Sohei Ofezi from the uh, computer science department at the UMD. And his talk is about generative advisory networks. Let's welcome you. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks uh, for being here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, generative adversarial networks, or GANs. And we are going to talk about some formulations and designs and and uh, hopefully some you know, computational aspects of it. OK, so it's a workshop on quantum machine learning. So the emphasis at uh, this talk is on the second two words. But hopefully, we can brainstorm about you know, relationships with this uh, new machine learning method and uh, quantum computing. OK. Uh, all right, so feel free to stop me anytime during the talk. Uh, OK, so because after that, I have a, you know, a lecture to give, uh, and I won't be able to be in the coffee break. So uh, interrupt me if you have any questions during the presentation. OK. OK, so we'll start slow. What is uh, the task in hand? So we want to learn a generative model. So what does it mean? It means that you observe some data uh, from you know, your measurements, and you want to have a probabilistic model in order to generate new data. Right? So you want to learn the underlying probability distribution of this data. So this is an age-old problem, perhaps going back to you know, 100 years ago from Gauss, and that they basically fitting a Gaussian distribution or other types of parametric distributions to the observed data. OK. Uh, but in the last uh, couple of years, there has been a new approach to this problem. It is called Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. OK, let me explain how GANs deal with this problem, and then we'll go a little bit deeper into its formulation. Okay. So you, we observe some samples from a distribution, y1 to yn. This is my data set. OK, and I want to be able to create some data that are similar to the observed data points. OK, first I'm going to generate some random samples from a Gaussian distribution. This has nothing to do with the data that I have observed. Then there is a generator function, this function, whose goal is to transform these samples to fake samples that are realistic as well. So the goal of the generator is to have y hat as similar to y as possible. All right, but there is a discriminator or a critic in the uh, picture who looks at the real data, y, and my generative model, y hat. And the goal is to try to distinguish between, between the two. Okay, maybe it computes its statistics you know, for y samples and y hat samples and see if it is different or not. OK, so then you can formulate this as a min-max problem. So the generator is minimizing a distance between real and fake data. And the discriminator is trying to maximize the difference between the two and tells the difference between the two. All right, so the generator and the discriminator, they are functions. Usually in machine learning, in modern machine learning, we characterize and represent these functions with Neural networks. So we put neural networks as our generator and the discriminator. OK, then you can think about an optimization problem. It is a mean max optimization problem. The generator is minimizing over set of parameters it has, g. And the discriminator is maximizing this objective function over its set of parameters, d. And we have an objective function that depends on g and d. OK, okay so. The purpose of this talk is to understand what is this f should be, right? Because I can put any you know, function f, but it may not give me a meaningful solution at the end. Um, we are going to uh, talk about how we can design a good objective function for this problem. OK, one note is that the dimension of this input to the ge generator doesn't need to match the dimension of the observed samples. For example, these samples, these can be you know, uh, 1,000 dimensional samples. But the random samples I generate can be two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. But this generator will map from an r-dimensional vector to a d-dimensional vector. 
Okay, and that's how we make it a little bit of a dimensionality reduction when we are learning the generative model. All right, so this is how GANs basically intuitively invented. Any questions so far? Yes? Uh, don't you want first, uh, so the minimization and maximization order, I guess, matter, right? It does matter. The don't minim you want first to minimize the, uh, the difference between the big data and the data and only then to discriminate them? Okay, we'll come to that point. If you wait uh, two, three slides, we're, we are gonna see why we have a first minimization and then maximization, but that's an excellent question. We'll come to that point in two, three slides. Any other questions? Okay, very intuitive, right? So I'm a generator, I'm trying to generate you know, realistic fake samples, but you know, there is a critic who looks at real samples and fake samples and tries to tell the difference between the two. Okay, uh, and as I said, the random samples usually, you know, we, you can use any distribution here that can be easily sampled, but often a Gaussian distribution is being used. Okay, if you look at the literature in the last two, three years, literally there are like zillions of different GAN architectures and formulations, and these are some examples. So it kind of shows, okay, so people are very excited about this problem, but also we don't quite agree on uh, some set of uh, good architectures for uh, this uh, model. So I'm, we are gonna, I'm gonna talk about why these differences among different architects, their architectures, they come into the picture. Okay, so how GANs are designed? In practice, they're model free, presumably. We don't have any particular assumption on the data and we just put these uh, function classes on generators and discriminators. And the evaluation are primarily done on real data sets. So we don't have a you know, quantitative way to see if this is a good generative model or not. For example, if you look at uh, some of these GAN papers, uh, if we train a GAN on a celebrity face uh, data set, then the gen generator is able to generate a fake but realistic, you know, images. In other words, we can have, um, you know, fake celebrities, but they uh, may look like you know, uh, real celebrities. Okay. What are the issues about most of these architectures? Okay. So first of all, the training of GANs seems to be very challenging. So as I said, there is a min-max optimization. We need to solve it, right? So we formulate it, we need to solve it. The common approach is using something called alternating gradient descent. It means that you're taking one gradient step in the generator's space, fixing the parameters of the discriminator, and then you're taking one gradient step in discriminator's space, fixing parameters of the generator. And then you alternate between the two. Very efficient, like the two, three lines of code, but the problem is that it sometimes doesn't converge. Right? So you, if you look at the loss, it may decrease, but at some point it may increase. And I wanna emphasize it is not because of non-convexity of the objective function. Because even if you have a non-convex objective function and you do gradient descent, you are gonna decrease your loss, but perhaps not as low as you wish. But here, because you're jumping from the space of the generator to the discriminator by taking the gradient, you may not see a good convergence behavior. So other issues, there is an issue called mode collapsing. If you have a multimodal distribution, sometimes the generator is missing some of the modes in its output. It's one of the issues of GANs. And generalization can be poor. So, you know, this is from a more statistical point of view. How many samples do you need in order to learn the distribution using this framework? So uh, this can be poor. It, in other words, there are some cases that you may need exponentially many samples in the dimension of your input in order to learn a, even a simple distribution, okay? And performance, as I said, is often subjective, okay? So even though we have all of these issues, but in practice, people have observed that, okay, so if you're carefully, you know, uh, uh, tuning the parameters and carefully designing the generators and the discriminators, the performance is just mind-blowing. So it captures very complex distribution. So it shows there is a promising direction here using to learn the 
uh, distribution of the data, but there are some issues that we need a, a deeper understanding and a more fundamental understanding to be able to resolve them. Okay, so maybe one way to deal with these issues to have a better understanding is to think about some benchmarks that we know what are the good generative models and then we can try to use GANs on those benchmarks to see where the system is breaking, where all of these uh, uh, issues that I explained coming to the picture. Okay, what is the simplest high dimensional distribution that I may first try as my benchmark? That's a question. Gaussian, Gaussian distribution, right? So it is easy uh, to you know, understand different you know, theoretical properties of it. We know benchmarks for this. In the, uh, in the case that the dimensions match, we know the maximum likelihood solution for this. When the dimensions don't match, when the, the input, the dimension of the input to the generator is smaller than the real you know, dimension that we observe, we have like the PCA solution for the Gaussians. These are all classical results that we know about the Gaussians. Okay, so the question is, can I uh, use this as a benchmark and uh, first of all, evaluate these state-of-the-art GANs on this simple benchmark and see if how they perform. And if they don't perform well, maybe I can try to use some properties of my data in designing the GAN architecture. Okay, first we say, okay, we take this benchmark, we generate samples from a Gaussian distribution, simple, right? And we apply some of the state-of-the-art GAN architectures to see if they can succeed in this very simple task, right? You can't do easier than this. You wanna just learn a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so from this list, of course I can't, you know, I can, but I don't have time to try all of them. So I uh, uh, use the top, kind of, you know, to the state-of-the-art GAN architectures. I'm gonna dive into the details of them, but uh, let's say if one of them is Washington GAN, the other one is Washington GAN with gradient penalty. Okay, and I generate data from a 32-dimensional normal distribution with identity covariance, even I don't put a um, um, complicated covariance, you know, matrix. And these are the performance results. Remember R is the dimension uh, to the input dimension to the generator. And this is the error measure for Benius norm between the estimated covariance and the covariance uh, of the true data, which is the identity. And as you can see, okay, there are several issues about the performance uh, plots that we get. You know, the errors, they don't go to zero. It may depend on the initializations. There are two initializations, Ha and Glarat, that we tried, uh, and there are popular initializations. They may end up in different, you know, solutions. Sometimes it doesn't even converge, it blows up, okay? So I am happy to talk about the details of the experiments, but that's not the point. So the point here is that not, they don't do very well if we just take these off-the-shelf GAN architectures. But maybe we can, you know, give them a, a little bit of a slack saying, okay, I know my distribution is a Gaussian distribution and I know my input to the generator is Gaussian itself. So I won't use a nonlinear function in my generator, right? Maybe because I'm giving too much freedom to it, it makes this a little bit uh, unstable. So we tried linear generators. It improves the performance plus. As you see, we don't have a lot of uh, um, oscillations when we use linear generators, but it's still the issues remain the same. For example, here we converge to different points. There, there are gaps with the solutions that we know. These are the baseline solutions. This is the PCA solution. I know in the Gaussian case, this is the best I can do. So, and that's exactly why we are thinking about baselines because we know this is the best I can do. Here you see like the error is even getting higher even though you know, in the pre some of the plus, this, this was better than uh, the other method. And here the gap is even larger. Okay, even though I put some linear generators, uh, it helped but not much. Okay, 
Now the question is that are GANs universal learning methods? Because here the way that I was using GANs, we didn't uh, uh, use properties of my input distribution, my observed distribution. So our idea is to can we use some of the characteristics of the data in order to design proper GAN architectures. And that's what we call model-based approach to designing GANs. Okay. So the first question that we are asking here is there a good GAN architecture to learn a Gaussian distribution? Okay. Is this an absolutely stupid question or not? Uh, one second. So I know how to learn a Gaussian distribution, right? It's like as easy as it can be, right? I, you know, in the full dimensional case, I do the empirical mean, empirical covariance. In the low dimensional case, I'll do that and I'll just do a PCA, principal component analysis on the empirical covariance. Like, okay, so we are not in a desperate need to design again to learn Gaussians. So the whole idea is to do this practice in order to see what are the issues, how we can use some of the properties of the input distribution in designing the GANs. Hopefully that can teach us a few lessons in order to design GANs for more complex distributions. Yes? I entirely answer Okay, fantastic. All right, great. Uh, all right, so uh, let me see how I'm doing with time. Okay, good. Okay, so we have an answer. Otherwise, probably I wouldn't have given this talk. <laughs> All right, so the answer is uh, this GAN architecture. So uh, the generator, you know, is, should be linear because we have a linear randomness here and I want to, you know, generate a Gaussian distribution. What about the discriminator? Discriminator turns out to be a little bit complicated, more complicated than we expected. So the, there are two functions applied to, as I said, we compute like statistics from the data and compare the two statistics. It turns out that the functions that we need to apply to the real and fake data, they are related but not the same. Okay, so here we are applying a quadratic function to the real data with this matrix, identity minus a PST matrix. And here I am applying the pseudo inverse of that matrix minus identity to the fake data, and I'm subtracting these two. Okay, so where did this come from? Did we just... Uh, instead of cheating, like if the discriminator knows which port the real data is coming in, the fake data is coming in, then you can discriminate between them. Right? Perfect, perfect. So, uh, ex okay, so is this like that, or is this like, or even did we just try and error different functions to see, you know, which ones, you know, give us the answer. So no, this is not the point. So the point here is that can we have like a principled end-to-end -end approach in order to come up with structures like this? And I'm going to explain it, but I first uh, showed the uh, end product. Uh, just wait a couple of uh, minutes and you'll see where these functions, they appear. Okay, so, okay, what is my optimization then? When you have a structure like this, I won't go into the details, but you can write a mean max optimization formulating the objective. So why do we have these trace functions? Okay, so I'm summing up of this function over different you know, samples, and then you use a, the trace uh, cyclic property, you put yy transpose here, you get the covariance here, and similar to here. So basically this objective function is equivalent to this architecture that we have here, but you don't need to worry about this objective function. All right, so how are we doing? We are doing really well. So these are the previous uh, GAN performance, and here you can see we need like much fewer iterations, and we exactly recover the baseline that I was hoping for. And just to give you some sense, these GANs, they run for a couple of hours to generate these plots. Uh, this plot I generated, it took literally less than two seconds. So one point something, but say less than 10 seconds, just to be safe. Anyhow, all right, so how did we design the scan? Did we cheat? Hopefully we didn't. What are the theoretical guarantees and what are the lessons we can learn from this uh, uh, architecture? Okay, so as I said, we think about the GAN as a mean max optimization over uh, objective function that couples G and D. So first we'll think about a good population solution. 
What does this mean? It means that don't worry about the number of samples you have. I give you infinite number of samples. Life is good. Go and design a good GAN architecture. So this is going to be your initial formulation. We don't worry about you know, statistical properties of this. OK, and then reality will kick in and we'll think about the sample, uh, number of samples that we have in practice. And then maybe we'll, we'll tr modify this initial formulation in order to address that issue as well. And the last issue is the convergence and computational stability of GANs. And we are going to see if, at least in this case, if you have a good formulation that addresses these two points, we are lucky and we get this for free. OK, good. Formulating GANs. Perhaps these this two slides are the most important slides. Maybe a little bit complicated, but we'll go through it. OK, so what are the inputs? So I'm a computer scientist, but some part of me is an engineer. OK, so I first write down the stuff that I have as my inputs. So I have observed samples, y1, 2, yn. I generate some random samples, maybe the same number, maybe different number of random samples. It doesn't matter from a Gaussian distribution. And I pick a generator class, G. So I say these are the function classes I'm going to use as my generator. So what is my goal? My goal is to pick a member from this class of G such that when I apply G on X, in distribution it is similar to the distribution of Y, the distribution that I have observed. Okay, that's my goal. All right. How to formulate this problem? Okay, so this formulation is kind of similar to what we know in a related problem, but not exactly the same problem, right? So this is an unsupervised learning problem because I observe some data without any labels. Maybe I can think about a supervised version of this. So what is a supervised learning problem? In supervised learning, I observe pairs of samples, x1, y1, x2, xn, yn, and I want to apply a function to x to predict the labels y. That is my goal in supervised learning. Very concrete goal. OK, and I know how to solve it. I know how to formulate it, to formulate that problem. Again, the goal here is to find a function in my class such that g of x approximates y closely. Think about the difference. Here, I want the g of x to be similar to y in distribution. I don't care about point-wise approximation of these points. Here, in supervised learning, I want to be able to predict the labels that are assigned to each x, y's that are assigned to each x. Okay? So let's see how we deal with this problem in machine learning. So how we formulated this problem, we pick a loss function, pick or favorite loss function, like quadratic loss or any type of loss that you may wish. And then the most common approach is something called empirical risk minimization. You look at the quality of each of the generators, uh, each of the Gs. You look at the loss that it causes in the prediction. And you look at the average loss over all of the samples that you have observed. And you pick the best G possible. And you declare victory, and then you go and have fun. OK, uh, this is supervised learning. But I want to somehow use this framework in order to solve my problem, this problem. OK, I want to have a reduction from unsupervised to the supervised learning. OK, something that was missing here is a loss function. Maybe I can, again, here pick a loss function. Maybe a quadratic loss, maybe any other type of loss function that I have. Now I'm getting closer to that picture. OK, so what is missing here? So if I had a coupling between x's and y's, right? say I put like x1 corresponds to y1, x2 is coupled to y2, xn is coupled to yn. Right? If I had this coupling, then I could solve this problem exactly, because I have already picked the loss function. And I would solve this optimization. I'll pick a good G from my class. But I don't have the coupling, 
right? Maybe I need to use x2 in order to predict y1, and x1 in order to predict y2, and so on and so forth. Right, so the only difference here is that I don't have the coupling here. Here I have the coupling. This is given to me by the nature. Okay, so then what can I do about this? Is this a harder problem or is this an easier problem? It may look like a harder problem, but in fact it's an easier problem because I have more freedom. I can pick my favorite coupling. Maybe this problem would give me a loss value of 10, but maybe if I uh, couple this with this one, couple this with this one, I can get a loss value of one. I'm picking the best coupling that favors me. Okay, So that is the whole idea. So the whole idea is to pick the best coupling for our problem and reduce the problem to the supervised learning. Yes? If x's and y's are both like random numbers, why does it, why should the coupling matter at all? Okay, so this is, the, this is the thing, right? In supervised learning, I have the coupling, right? X and Y's are given in a tuple, right? You're saying, okay, X is like features some, of something and Y is the variable, you know, the labels that I want to predict. Here, I don't have it, okay? Forget about like the you know, meanings of these Y's and X's and different applications. So if I want to reduce my problem to the supervised learning problem, I need a coupling in order to use the optimization that I developed for supervised learning. Okay, but in the next slide, it's gonna be even more clear. Okay, so I pick my favorite loss function. Maybe it depends on the domain I'm, you know, designing GANs. And I have data, right? So no coupling here. Okay, but I have like this black box of doing supervised learning for me if I knew the coupling between x's and y's. If I knew it, I could solve the supervised learning problem. Okay, so the first thing is to have an identity coupling. I just, you know, couple x's to y's with the same indices and this is the identity coupling. But I can pick any coupling, right? So I have more freedom in order to do that. I can pick even this coupling and this will be the coupling between x's and y's, and my supervised learning will use those couplings in order to find a good g. Okay, so what is my optimization then? For any given coupling, again, I'm using a supervised learning optimization. I'm minimizing a loss between yi and g of x of the one that is coupled to that, pi of i, right? And I'm picking the best g for this particular coupling. But in general, I'll even optimize over my couplings. I'll even pick the best coupling that gives me the least amount of prediction loss. In other words, what I have done is to reduce my unsupervised learning problem to a bunch of supervised learning problem, and I'm picking the easiest one for my uh, optimization. Okay, good. All right. Okay, any questions so far? I'd like to reiterate this question. Yes. So, if you know, these x's and y's are just uh, vectors that are being generated at random from two different distributions. Why should it, any one of them be coupled with any other? I mean, if you're just, and so when you're picking the best one, you could easily just be fooling yourself that there's some relationship between them. Okay, good, good question. So I'm generating from, I'm, okay, okay. No, I, I thought that, you know, <laughs> I answered that, but good question. So here so I have, become clear at the next slide and yes, wasn't. it wasn't clear. Okay, good, very good. Here, I have my marginal distributions, px and py, right? Here, I have the joint distribution, px and y. Here, I have freedom to pick the joint distribution between x and y that satisfies these marginals. You are having, you are just giving me px and py, the two marginal distributions, but still I have freedom in order to pick my joint distribution to I, reduce my loss, however you define it. I, I understand what you're doing mathematically. Mm -hmm. I'm just, it's, it seems a weird thing to do is all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, okay. Uh, well, hopefully it, it will. It doesn't seem motivated by the way the, the 
initial problem. But fine, look, so Okay, it is motivated. Think about it. Because you want your x's, g of x, it's the output of your generator, right? right. So you want you know, this to have some relationship at least with some of the samples that you are observing. And that's what we are doing here. Very is good. Is there a reason why you suspect that a simple permutation or a one-to-one -one map is good enough? Perfect. Just wait, you know, one more slide. I have one slide about that. It will hopefully be clear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, make fake clear. promises. <laughs> no fake promises. Okay. Okay. So one point that I want to emphasize here. Okay, here we are using permutations, right? First of all, uh, First of all, we are making here one assumption. Why the number of fake and real samples should be the same, right? If it is different, if it is longer, then you can't use a permutation, right? Because uh, you won't be able to even satisfy that marginal constraint that you have. Okay, so if in that case, you can replace this with a softer constraint. It's the joint distribution between X and Y. And you can repeat this optimization instead of like the permutation, use the joint distribution in your optimization. Okay? Uh, okay, so the question is, is this, does this give a unique solution? You know, why, why, do you, why are you doing this? But let's, <laughs> let's massage this optimization a little bit more because, you know, it will make things more clear. Okay, my generator is given, my loss function I have picked, and I have data and I have randomness. Qy, Qx. I just represented that empirical distribution. So I'm minimizing over the coupling between x and y, and I'm picking one coupling, and I'm minimizing this loss over g. Then it's a min-min problem. You can, you know, switch between the two means, and I define g of x as y hat, just to simplify notations. This becomes this optimization. So y hat is g of x. I so, you know, just switch the, you know, the two means. Okay. So then something interesting is happening here. This inner optimization is becoming the optimal transport distance between the distribution y that I have observed and the distribution y hat that I am generating. So this is a very old problem. So it started. Uh, late, you know, in you know, around 7, 1795 by Monk, first called the Monk problem, just the inner optimization, not the outer optimization. And that had some uh, constraints later on relaxed by the Russian mathematician Kontrovich. And uh, we got this final formulation for this. Sometimes probably you heard about Wasserstein distance. It is related to this optimal transport. I'll explain it or earth mover distance. In different areas, it may have different names. Okay, so what is the solution for this one? Okay, in general, I won't go into the details of optimal transport solution. Uh, under some conditions, you can show that it gives a unique solution. But uh, those conditions, the architectures that we are gonna you know, develop, they're in fact based on those conditions. So we know that we have a, we'll have a unique solution. But in general, there is like a field in mathematics talking about what are the best transport plans between the two distributions. Do they have some you know, smoothness? Do, do you have uniqueness? And things like that. So I won't go into the details of it, but if you're interested, uh, I'm happy to talk offline about it. Did that answer your question? I don't think so. <laughs> <coughs> I will say that this seems better motivated than this talk about the permutation yeah, of things. Because that's just one way of coming up with a joint. Okay, you are going to see v x and y. And this is here you're saying, okay, let's like assume that there's a distribution for x and y, and let's minimize over all of that. There is a purpose behind that reduction. So the purpose is the following. Okay, so if you know, think about this loss function. No, I have a good way of specifying this loss function in my optimization, right? In super, uh, 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> okay, good. This is the important slide. So in supervised learning, for example, if you have a Gaussian distribution or if you have some other you know, distributions, you may pick the loss function that fits your uh, data, fits your 
characteristics of your distribution. No, we cannot think about this as a way to think about some loss functions that may be appropriate for my application. And that's why we are doing that reduction. Anyway, so let me go a little bit faster than um, uh, what I intend. Okay, so we have this formulation, right? But where is this mean max optimization? It, hasn't, it doesn't look like a GAN. And maybe somebody's gonna complain again that you promised to talk about GANs, but you are talking about this optimization. But in fact, if you look at this inner uh, optimization here, well, right now you're only talking this is, about, you're only talking about the just give me one second. So if you look at the inner optimization here, so this is a linear program, right? So you can write it as dual function. If you write this dual function, you get another optimization. So here your optimization variables, they are the joint distribution. They are, uh, you have a matrix and you're optimizing over this. It turns out that when you write the dual uh, do all of that optimization, you're optimizing over a function class, this psi. Okay, so what is this dual? It is called control which duality. So you get some restrictions on the functions that you're optimizing over, so they should be L convex, and this function that is applied to the marginal of y hat is the L conjugate of that function. Okay, you see now it is kind of becoming more and more clear the GAN architectures. Can I represent this as my GAN architecture? Yes. Again, so I have some random sample here. So I'm gonna use my generator here, but I have two functions, psi and L conjugate of that psi. Right, and this psi comes from the duality. And I'll apply this minus psi to my real data, and I'll apply minus psi L conjugate to my fake data. Okay, now we are getting closer to the architecture that I showed you at the beginning, but it's still different. Okay, so we have a little bit more complex function classes that we are optimizing over. Okay, uh, first of all, this formulation can um, recover many of the state-of-the-art GAN formulations, like Washington GAN is nothing that you replace this loss with L2 loss. If you replace that, you'll get the Washenstein GAN. Okay, and that's W GAN. Okay, so what is the right loss function for learning Gaussians? Quadratic loss, right? So from even Gauss, we know it is easier to analyze uh, quadratic loss for Gaussians. And we have seen uh, it is used in many you know, applications in supervised learning, in Weiner, Weiner filter, Kalman filter, and so on and so forth. So instead of L2, I'm gonna use L2 squared. Okay, if I do that, I get quadratic GAN. That's something that we call it quadratic GAN 101. So, uh, okay, so what is this? So it is exactly the same optimization, but now I have an understanding about the loss function that I should use in my problem. So for Gaussian, I'm using the quadratic uh, loss function. And that gives us the second order Wasserstein distance as or optimal transport. And I'm optimizing, I'm finding a G that minimizes this distance. Okay, in quadratic GAN, those formulations that we have for psi and L conjugate of psi becomes simpler because I have a quadratic loss function. So I can put that in my equations and I'll, become, I'll get simpler equations. So what are the equations that I get? Here I get uh, this equation, psi, L con convexity, just simplifies to the convexity. So I'll have an optimization over convex functions and L conjugate here simplifies to just the convex conjugate, the convex conjugate that we are all familiar with. Okay, good. Uh, we are getting closer. So this architecture has very good uh, uh, properties in terms of its limit solutions. When R is equal to D, it recovers the ground truth, maximum likelihood solution, and when R is smaller than D, it recovers the PCA solution. These are the solutions that I really wanted from my GAN architecture. Okay, but it has a problem. As I said, we didn't assume any limitation on the number of samples I have observed. We assume we have an infinite amount of samples. And it turns out that this architecture uh, by itself, first of all, no computational because we don't have, we, it is hard to characterize all convex functions. But more importantly, 
it requires exponentially many samples in order to learn even a simple Gaussian distribution. Right? It's a big problem for us. Okay, so next level, we need to understand where this generalization problem is coming to the picture in order to solve it. So we started with unsupervised learning problem, we reduced the supervised learning problem, we picked the proper loss function, we were happy, and we saw that in solutions that we are getting when we have infinite amount of samples make sense, but no, another problem, generalization. Is it, can you, I'm sorry, but it still looks as if you're allowing the discriminator to apply a different function to the real data and the fake data. Sure. It still looks like cheating. Why not? Why, why do you think that we shouldn't apply two functions to real well, and fake data? My understanding of GANs is that the picture is that the discriminator is given a piece of data and not told whether it's real or fake and then has to apply a single network to analyze that. No, that's, that is one simplistic way to look at GANs. But in general, I can put anything for my discriminator because later on, after training, I'm just going to throw this away. I'm not going to keep my discriminator. The only thing that I care is to get a good generator. Right? I can apply two different functions. If they are not related to each other, I won't get a good solution. I need some sort of relationship between the two. They may be exactly the same. Uh, they may be different, but related to each other. But I don't care about how I'm designing my discriminator. Because later on, I'm just going to throw it away. The only thing that I care is having a good generator. OK? All right. So where do we get this poor generalization here? OK. OK, think about uh, the space of the optimal transport uh, 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 when we, we measure the distances with the Wasserstein um, you know, metric. Okay, so this is the population solution. This is the Gaussian solution that I have. And this is the empirical version that I'm observing. Right? So I'm observing M samples from this Gaussian distribution. It turns out that the distance between these two can be extremely large. It is a little bit different than like KL divergence or other divergence measures that you generate a couple of samples, maybe like you know, polynomial in the dimension, and you have a small you know, divergence measures. In Wallerstein, the distance is roughly, so this is a random variable itself. But it concentrates heavily around this number, uh, which is n to the minus 2 over d. n is the number of samples, d is the dimension. In other words, in order to have this epsilon small, you need your n to be exponential in dimension. OK, otherwise, then uh, you will have issues. If you have another distribution here, your learner will pick this distribution, not your actual distribution. OK, so can we, what, what can we do about here? OK, so the idea is to properly restrict the discriminator, because my generator is already restricted, right? It's a linear function. If I do this, uh, I need to maintain two properties. One is that my first, my original optimal solutions, the good optimal solutions, I want to keep them optimal when I'm doing this restriction, because now I'm changing my optimization problem. But I also don't want to introduce spurious optimal solutions by introducing these new constraints. And it turns out that in this case, you can, instead of looking at the convex functions, you can restrict your discriminators to only convex quadratic functions, having those two properties satisfied. OK, this is quadratic function, and you can write that uh, in a simpler form as this. And this is the architecture that we started from. OK, you see like there is a, you know, um, uh, pipeline that gave us this architecture. So again, it maintains the solutions that we wanted, maximum likelihood solution in the full dimension, the PCA solution in the low dimension. But the most important thing is that now it has a fast generalization rate. So the number of samples I need is linear in the dimension that I have. OK, so uh, now I have uh, maybe five minutes. OK, so I have two options. Um, uh, so one option is to talk about uh, stability. Um, and another option is to talk about a very interesting result uh, we got recently. And uh, we are putting the paper on archive uh, even you know, this week or today. 
Uh, okay, let me maybe uh, aim to talk about both of them, but quickly. I'm happy to answer questions later on. Okay, so we have a good formulation, right? So we have a good population solution, good number of samples, how to solve it? As I said, in practice, we are using an alternating gradient descent, right? So we take one step in gradient, one step in gradient step in generator, one gradient step in discriminator, and we alternate. In other words, if you look at the gradient, so these are your gradient flows, so say it's a one-dimensional, just to, for purpose of you know, visualization. You take one step here, and then you take one step here. So these flows, they may take you to different points in this space. So this is G star and D star I want. So the stability says, if I start from some random point here, and I'm just taking you know, you know, uh, flows of my gradient, would that take me to this solution? Or would that even oscillate, maybe it just you know, goes you know, in a circle. Or it may end up in a bad solution, that's like bad saddle points, right? So what is happening here? Now we have this you know, concrete objective function, at least in this simple case, I can analyze it using a nonlinear dynamical system. So the question is, does this converge for us? Okay, so we have done the analysis for the full rank case. As I said, this is the uh, op optimization that we have here. Okay, so if you think about GG transpose as a PST matrix U, this optimization, this mean max, becomes a simple optimization. It becomes convex in U and concave in the, in the D part. And there are results that, uh, in this case, alternating gradient descent is one of the classical results under some you know, regularity constraints that I'm not going into, the details of it, it will converge to the point of interest. But the question is that I'm not doing, I'm not doing optimization over U, right? My, I'm doing gradient updates over G, not U. In that case, we cannot use this result. But we have shown that, say, for instance, if your covariance is identity, it's still the same thing holds, even you are doing the your gradient updates on the generator, on G instead of U. Okay, so why is that happening? It is something interesting came up here. So in order to, you know, in control theory, in order to talk about the global convergence of a system, one approach is to define a, a Lyapunov function. You have a potential function that even you are saying, I may get a little bit further away from my, um, global point, global solution, but that potential function is always decreasing over all the trajectories I have. And it turns out this Van Neumann divergence plays as a Lyapunov function in our case. Uh, let me just show some curves here. So this is one trajectory. This is the distance of my point to the global optimizer. You see, I'm decreasing, decreasing, but I may increase. So it is not a monotonically decreasing uh, trajectory to the point. So sometimes the flows may push me a little bit away, but then I come back. In another example, I may have multiple, you know, uh, you know, going away and coming back. But it seems, you know, again, I converge. So this is the Frobenius distance between G and G star. What about if I plot my Lyapunov function here? You see, my Lyapunov function, even though in these cases that I have you know, ups and downs, it is monotonically decreasing. And that is basically the heart of the convergence proof. So as far as I know, this is the first global stability proof of some GAN architectures. OK, so uh, I don't have time, or do I? Maybe one minute? OK. Uh, OK, so. There is something quite interesting about GANs and you know, generative models. Okay, something a little bit strange, right? Because we didn't put any assumption on the explicit model of the data, right? Previously, or some approaches called VAEs, or this kind of coming from like classical view to this problem, we used to consider an explicit model for the data, like a Gaussian model or some sort of model. And maybe we are maximizing the log likelihoods if we could, or maybe we are maximizing a lower bound. It's called the variational lower bound on the log likelihoods. 
Okay, so this is also another approach to this problem. Makes sense, it's kind of coming back from you know, all of the history we have from Gauss and things like that. We are looking at some approximations of the log likelihoods, maybe a lower bound on that, and then we are maximizing that, okay? What about GANs? GANs, we don't have an explicit probability model. You know, here we are minimizing the distance between just two distributions, between observed distribution and the generative distribution. It seems like there is a mismatch here. What is going on here? Because when, we don't, when I don't have an explicit probability model, I have a generator. Now, can I compute a likelihood or an approximation for the likelihood similar to VAEs? using GANs, right? It's an, it was an open question. So in our recent work, which will uh, hopefully be on archive you know, this week, we show that these GANs and VAEs are in fact related to each other. GANs meet VAEs. And the idea is to understand uh, the GAN framework. So this is the output of the you know, generator and use this in order to implicitly model the distribution of the data that it characterizes. So if we do that, we have proved that some uh, families of GANs, in fact, maximizes another lower bound on the likelihood function, another variational lower bound on the likelihood function, which is similar to the approach that VAEs are based on. Now we can use that surrogate, so it will, it's a little bit complicated, so I won't go into the details. It depends on some entropy regularizations of the couplings that we are obtaining. And if we do that, no, I have a statistical framework to, in, to use in GANs. Not only it gives me like a good generative model compared to VAEs and other approaches, but now I can compute likelihoods. Maybe I can do model selection. Maybe I can do multiple hypothesis, you know, correction. It is one experiment that this is the likelihood surrogate that we have, and this is the train on some subset of the data, and as you see, the likelihood, the log likelihood is quite high and with a small variance, but even now you can look at other data sets and you can see what is the likelihood of observing other data sets from the GAN that I train in this particular data set. And you will see that maybe if the data set is related uh, to my data, maybe I have a bimodal, uh, likelihood distribution, but if the data set that is not related, I may have a large variance, but the samples that may seem to have a sm larger likelihood, in fact, they are the ones that relate to some of the samples from my data set that I have used for training. So it gives us some way in order to do all of these statistical uh, inference problems uh, using GANs, which we couldn't do it because we didn't have an explicit model for the data. So if you're interested in uh, this topic, please check our paper in a couple of days. Okay, so to conclude what we have learned. So we have learned, hopefully, how to formulate a GAN objective to match the model. So the loss function is important, right? That was the whole point. You need to, in order to, because there are also disagreements among different GAN architectures, how to define the loss function. But that loss function comes from that reduction to the supervised learning problem, and we can pick it properly to uh, model in, based on our model. We realize that we need to worry about generalization uh, problem. If we didn't worry about it, even for the simple Gaussian case, we would need exponentially many samples in order to learn that model. And uh, we also need to worry about global stability or how, what are the computational behaviors uh, of different approaches to ha have a solution for GANs. Okay, so the and last question, which is uh, for uh, experts uh, in this room that are doing quantum stuff, can we think about a quantum formulation or a quantum approach to the GAN uh, optimization? Um, so I don't have that much expertise in quantum. I'm just you know, putting this you know, uh, question out there. If you have some thoughts about this, uh, let me know. So I'll be happy to uh, discuss it. OK, thank you. So any questions? Yes. So um, <clears throat> you showed that these quadratic objective functions then allow you to match Gaussians. 
Um, but we, we did already know how to match Gaussians without GANs, right? So do they work really well for other kinds of problems? So what sorts of problems do they, if it's, do they work for non-Gaussian? Perfect. So as I said, we, we are not in a desperate need to learn Gaussian distributions, yeah. right? So the whole purpose was to see how, you know, what are the different challenges in order to use some characteristics of the distribution in, in different components of GANs. If you use that exact, you know, architecture that I mentioned in other distributions, it will only give match like first and second, you know, moments yeah. because that's, you know, what, you know, defines a Gaussian distribution, but it won't give you give you a good generative model. For instance, now you can think about if you have a more complex distribution rather than Gaussian. For example, suppose you have a family of distributions that are coming from G of X when X is Gaussian but G is non-linear. Non so you consider this family and you say I'm observing one you know, family from this distribution which can be broad. Can I again go through all of these you know, uh, you know, steps and design a proper GAN architecture for that distribution. That's something that we are currently working on. We have some results, but uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll uh, put something out there uh, soon. Okay. Yes? So first one, you actually point to, to it. Uh, if you replace the quadratic loss with K of the divergence, have you looked at what sort of architecture you would get? Yes. So in fact, it's interesting, the GAN started with a loss function that is related to the KL divergence loss. It's called Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is, you know, kind of, you know, you're symmetrizing the KL divergence because it is not symmetric. Um, if you use that loss uh, function, um, you may get some results, but especially when there is a mismatch of the dimensions between your observed distribution and your generative distribution. Think about KL, right? So you have P of y log of you know P of y over P of y hat. If P of y is a high dimensional distribution, but P of y hat is a low dimension over a low dimensional maybe like a linear you know, manifold, then you'll be end up in cases that you have like one over zero or something over zero, and it doesn't make sense or it gives you some maybe you know constant numbers that can't tell you. Uh, the difference uh, between the two when you have a mismatch in the dimension. And here, uh, it was important for us to recover the PCA solution. So if you use the KL divergence, you won't be able to even define your problem when there is a mismatch in the dimensionality. And that was in fact one of the motivations that people, they, they're using the uh, optimal transport or Wasserstein distances among the distributions because for Wasserstein distance or optimal transport distance, you can, it's well defined everywhere. You have a discrete distribution, you have a continuous distribution. In different dimensions, it is well defined. So it has very good properties in terms of the conversions. Okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> kind of seems paradoxical that you first showed these networks can learn the distribution of celebrity faces, and then they can't learn Gaussian. So is that the case that? They learn those distributions with the higher, but what they give us is looks good. Yeah. So as I said, there are um, a couple of uh, points about that, right? One is that, first of all, those networks are uh, pretty tuned for, you know, for such data sets. Like for one specific data set, maybe they have been like some exhaustive search of all of these different parameters and, you know, architectures and number of steps that you do for computations and stuff. So it's a little bit, you know, fit to some particular data set, even not a distribution. So the second point is that, um, okay, so we are looking at some of the outputs of these, uh, you know, networks, but is there like a broader way of looking at the quality of your generative model altogether? Right, so there are some measures that people are looking at. For example, there's some score called inception score, and uh, you know, uh, it depends on like you know the classification, you know, accuracy of your model and things like that. But it's kind of hard in order to define a measure to you know see if I'm really recovering my distribution or I'm even memorizing or maybe I'm just doing this. So there, there have been some papers saying that maybe I'm not adding too much diversity if I'm just, you know, uh, 
uh, using some of these GAN architectures, and I'm in a way memorizing and you know perturbing a little bit. But in some cases, you know, it in fact learns something interesting. Uh, so one point I want to highlight here is that this statistical approach that I mentioned about GANs, this can even be used to evaluate quality of different GAN architectures. Because now, if you train a GAN uh, architecture, now you can look at the you know, likelihoods may be from another data set, you know, given the model that you have trained. And you can see, okay, so I expect to have a larger gap if I'm having a good GAN training. So in other words, I'm recovering my images, but I'm also, you know, pretty far from some other images that I shouldn't, shouldn't be able to uh, recover. So hopefully this can be used as a measure in order to uh, evaluate GAN qualities in general. Okay? Right, other... Uh, Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next talk will be